information is on there, and I'm excited to go over what I've read about it is free, and we're from Milanville, so had no clue for a lot of stuff, so I'm excited to hear about the history and, and what well, it's developing for that. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. I want to thank the Damascus Township Historical Society for, for um, inviting me tonight. Um, I met Opal at the uh, PennDOT poster session that was held at uh, Narrowbird Union on April 25th. And on the bridge, yes. Yes, and she and asked if I would boss. give a presentation on industry. Yeah. Um, and I said that I, it never occurred to me before to think of industry under the context of local history, but I guess it is, and I'm, so am I, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also want to thank my partner, Jill Bailey, Padua, for helping with the uh, recording tonight and for listening to my stories uh, about Innisfree. Um, my mother, Ann Rue, and her wife, Karen, are here together tonight. Uh, they made the trip from Greentown, and if my mother discovers any errors or omissions, I will trust her to correct me. My mother was the first secretary of Industry Corporation and one of, one of the original group of founders, which I'll explain in a few minutes. I was first elected secretary of Industry Corporation in 1972 at the age of 13. At the age of 13, I did not do a lot. But I took some minutes. Uh, but I did put a lot of work into it from 1982 to 1998. Um, the surviving books and records of Industry Corporation are along with a lot of files and photos are in my possession. Um, this, this, this view is probably familiar to many of you. Um, it's largely obscured by trees these days, but that's it. Um, recent owners and operators and business names of the property, Hillside Farm, 1929 to 1961. Multiple buildings and infrastructures designed and built by A.J. Thomas and operated as a small farm and family resort together with his wife, Anna Thomas, on parcels of land that they purchased from families by the name of Knapp, Skinner, and other old local families. And there's a handout that I think has been circulated that goes into some more detail about that, um, particularly Mr. Knapp and his, uh, the loss of his life. He was the, the only law enforcement officer in the history of Wayne County who was killed in the line of duty. Um, and that goes back to the 1920s. He, he was there on that property, owned property there. Known as Hillside Acres, operated by Vivian Thomas Rothke and Oscar Rothke, much as her parents had, op had operated. She was A.J. Thomas's daughter. Uh, they had a loyal clientele of families who returned to the small resort each year for summer visits. From 1970 to 1989, it was known as Innisfree, um, the property was owned and operated by Industry Corporation, which incorporated in May 1970, founded by a group of teachers and secondary school students to host summer programs, initially described as an experiment in democracy. The corporation later operated as a youth hostel, bed and breakfast, retreat, conference center, and a community center on the same land. And this doesn't really seem like a transition because it didn't feel like a transition, but the transition in ownership, 1989 to 1993, uh, known as Innisfree, property was purchased by Bud Man Roo from Innisfree Corporation and leased back to the organization. Still operated exclusively not for profit, with no changes from the above until Innisfree Corporation dissolved in 1995. Uh, from 1998 to present, uh, Cynthia Nash purchased it from Ann Roo, my mother on July 17, 1998, after Budler's death, which Cynthia describes the place as a local landmark and an incubator for community and creativity. Um, Hillside Acres, Hillside Farm, uh, by April 1929, uh, Opal brought this uh, clipping to my attention, an item from the Wayne Independent, I think, wasn't labeled, but I believe that's what it was, that A.J. Thomas has his house nearly completed and it will be a great asset to my own bill. 1930 census listed, listed A.J. Thomas as born in Lithuania, a self-employed poultry farmer, 40 years of age, with his native New Yorker wife, 10 years, Anna, 31, and their children, Alfred and Vivian, 11 and 6. 
Unlike the Hawker family down the road toward Marysburg, the Thomas family did not own a radio, according to the 1930 census. But both Thomas' parents could read and write English, they told the enumerator. They worked hard with their hands in, in the Bruder house and in the fields and expanding and constructing guest buildings on the farm. The Thomases raised chickens and other small livestock at Hillside Farm. They boarded summer visitors in their resort near Stevens Falls, yielding a seasonal income for the Thomas family. A recreation building in the northeast corner of the property, which still stands, contained a dance hall, a day room in the front, and, two bed, and a two-bedroom apartment upstairs. Visitors danced to 78 RPM polka records in the recreation hall on the large Victrola jukebox, played shuffleboard across the street, and swam in the river. Um, I'm going to try to move through this quickly. And some of these transitions, like the little jumping around like that, I tried to get rid of it and I couldn't figure out how. <laughs> uh, this is the main house. On the left there, you can see what we call the dormitory building. The, the Thomases and the Rothkeys called it the annex. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, this was, um, we, we called it a chicken coop, but it's really a garage. At one time, it was obviously it was a chicken coop. Um, and there was another small brooder house to the left of that that uh, is no longer standing. That I don't, don't know how to, if I have a picture of the building. So there is one picture that I took of some chickens. I took the picture in 1970. This is the recreation hall. Um, there was a cottage up behind the dormitory. I believe that cottage is still there. I, in the last two years, I have um, Cynthia Nash has invited me twice, and I've, I've been there a couple of times. One time there was snow on the ground, and I, I have not been up to see the condition of the cottage. During 1970 and 1971, the Innisfree property was home base to a group of young educators, psychologists, students, and others who were exper experimenting with the nurturance and practice of freedom, self-determination, equality, democracy, peaceful coexistence, sustainability, respect, personal growth, and building community, one individual at a time. That's a lot to hope for. In those days, there was such hope. In 1970, the Board of Trustees of Industry delegated the governing power it had over the corporation to the 50-plus people living there. Industry's two first summers were said to be modeled after a book called Summerhill, a school in England, what they describe as the first libertarian school. Industry attempted to govern itself entirely by consensus. All participants were given an equal voice at general meetings where group decisions were made on questions like distribution of labor, chores, the meaning of ownership, and respect for public and private property and resources. The program is described as an experiment in democracy. Consensus is uh, agreement in opinion the collective unanimous opinion of a number of persons. It can also mean general agreement about an issue within a group or in public opinion. For example, there's a growing consensus of opinion on this issue, whatever the issue might be. So it can mean collective unanimous opinion, but not necessarily. It's a kind of a vague word, but consensus was, was the, uh, the goal. And it, it's for general meetings, uh, they could be called by anyone for any issue by ringing the dinner bell. If you saw the introductory slide, there was a big dinner bell is still there hanging outside of um, Cynthia's back door. Um, many meetings were held in the rec hall, which you saw a picture of a few minutes ago. Uh, meetings continued until a solution was reached. And you can see it, the intense expressions on the people's faces here. Some, some folks were better at talking, and they often got their way. <laughs> Those who were more reserved or shy did not always assert themselves. Consensus was the goal. A second type of meeting that was built into the schedule, which all participants were encouraged to take part in during the first two summaries, was key groups, also called sensitivity training. The, tra the training or key group is an approach to human relations training which, broadly speaking, provides participants with an opportunity to learn more about themselves and their impact on others, and in particular, 
to learn how to function more effectively in face-to-face -face situations. It attempts to facilitate this learning by bringing together a small group of people for the express purpose of studying their own behavior as it occurs when they interact with their small group. Uh, this is Data Hart on the left. She was a camper from Montclair High School. Bill Brown, he was one of the founders. He was a t teacher at Montclair High School. And that on the right is me. <laughs> Look the same. <laughs> Okay, an excerpt from a statement of philosophy. Our community is free as an experiment in democracy. By this we mean that it is essential for a human being to be most fully human, to learn how to govern himself and how to share in the government of others. To learn self-government, one must learn as much as possible about oneself. Such learning cannot come about through the imposition of values and experiences. And imposition is the characteristic process of the public school. It must come about by exercising free choices for oneself and examining these choices and their consequences to discover their meaning. On a relatively simple level, the members of industry will have to make choices daily regarding their use of time. Although a wide range of recreational, artistic, and educational opportunities will be available because of the physical and human composition of the community, the actualization of these resources will be made from the moment and day, and day to day by each member of the community. Industry is to be an alternative to what we see as a largely dehumanizing and mechanizing society. Unlike many other utopian projects, however, we are very much concerned with the relationship between our community and the society. Rather than being an experiment in escapism, we conceive of our program as developing in people the inner strength that comes through awareness to deal with the world at large. One may argue that we are a bunch of dreamy-eyed idealists. We do not think so. Did it work? This was Bud Rue, my father, writing in 1976, six years after the first summer. When we started industry, it was an attempt to get away from what we perceived as an oppressive way of educating people, talking about public schools. At this point, I'm not at all sure there is a way of getting away from it. It seems, in retrospect, there were many in industry who were oppressed or dominated by the articulate, and I'm not at all sure how to deal with that. I believe the humanistic principles we strive so hard for are reachable, but they are busted. It seemed like it was worth a try. And there's no question that industry's founding members and participants were idealists. Were they dreamy-eyed? I'm not sure what that means. They talked about utopian societies and what could be done to our own culture, specifically our system of publication, education, to make it less oppressive. Carl Rogers conceived of self-actualization, like fulfillment in many creative pursuits as requiring a balance of both freedom and limitations. An artist needs the freedom to explore and express, and also the discipline of technique, medium, and sometimes deadlines. Healthy human relationships include connectedness and individuality. But did it work? Was the 1970-71 model, as it was originally conceived, sustainable? No, in my, in my opinion, it was not. Um, was it a useful experience for participants? What do you say? I would say yes. I would say yes, and I said yes. <laughs> did it change the trajectory of many of the participants' lives? Yes, did it leave a lasting positive legacy in the local community? I think that it did. We should not be here. Um, actually, I made some changes in it. Did I, I'm going to come back to that. That's a video. Um, compliance with state and federal law. So yeah, there's that. Uh, the land was owned by the corporation. Corporation is a legal fiction that can lose control of itself or cease to exist if it does not follow governmental laws. Lawful governance of industry corporation is by a board of trustees that had a fiduciary responsibility for its actions. Organized in 1970 as a, non, as a New Jersey not for profit corporation, it had a certificate of authority to do business in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Industry property was licensed by the Pennsylvania DER for the operation of an organized camp and as a public eating and drinking place. And this entails rules that do not come from the community by consensus. They come from the government. 
as an instit educational institution, and its free corporation was recognized by the IRS as a tax, tax exempt entity under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code. But despite this status, it voluntarily paid local property taxes from 1970 until 1998. Despite the occasional use of the word free and some of the activities that are listed, Bud Rue sometimes had to explain to visitors that no, the inn is not free. The name of history comes from a 12-line poem by the Irish poet William Butler Yeats in 1888, The Lake Isle of Innisfree. At the end of an early pre-incorporation meeting of the founding group of teachers and students, one of the incorporators, Clark May Long, performed a musical rendition of that poem. And someone said, that's, that's the name that we want. And there was a consensus, and the name stuck. Um, well, if I can. If, I, if I were to click on that speaker there, we don't need to do it. I've got the voice of William Butler Yeats and a thick mm -hmm. Irish bro reading his poem. But uh, I will arise and go now and go to this free and this log cabin build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there a hive for the honey bee and live alone in the bee wild glade. Most of industry's founding trustees moved on to other, other activities. The group family remained to the extent that we were able, and new people arrived. Bud still had to make a leaving. He was not able to teach school in Pennsylvania or New York. He was only licensed to teach in New Jersey, and he was a member of that state's pension system and was well invested in it. The family spent weekends, holidays, and summers in Ennis Free. In 1981, the treasurer of Ennis Free Corporation a man who had come to the property to recover from a, actually was a motorcycle accident, tried to acquire the property in his own name. He filed a lawsuit that was settled a year or so later, and then he left. This case is not worth discussing in detail here. If you are interested in it, there are, is more detail about it on the website, except to note that it was resulted in formalizing of how corporate minutes and other records were maintained. And also, it marked a change in the amount of publicly accessible programming that was offered in industry. From 1972 to 1981, um, there were a number of tenants, a couple of bands, um, things like that, but not really much in the way of organized programming. Um, the Rue family continued driving up to industry. You never go down to industry, you only go up to industry. Um, Weekends, holidays, and the school was not in session. Um, I moved to, to industry full time after I finished graduate school at Ryder University, Ryder College in New Jersey in 1985. And Bud and Andrew, my parents, were able to do so as soon as my father was eligible to retire when he turned 55 in 1989. Bud Rue died in 1993 at the age of 59. And Andrew sold the property in 1998. <clears throat> what else happened at Ennis Free? The Ennis Free Country Inn and Retreat hosted overnight guests in the main house, the dorm, and the re recreation hall, and served home-cooked meals at affordable prices from 1981 to 1998. The Ennis Free Rec Hall was home to religious, weekly religious services of the Upper Delaware Unitarian Universalist Fellowship from 1987 to 1998. Outdoor exper experiential education and summer long math camp programs with teenagers from New Jersey public schools from 1981 to 1990, including field instruction by Peter Bug Tyler, <laughs> I'm sure many of you recall, uh, and who did a lot of work at industry and was a good friend. Upper Delaware Amnesty International, Chapter 533, met in the main house in the 1990s. Early meetings of Wayne County Habitat for Humanity, founded by Budrow in 1990, continues today with widespread support of multiple faith organizations and local volunteers around Wayne County. Free space for the Delaware Highlands Conservancy, founded by Barbie Yeaman in 1994. I was told that Andrew was a board member at the time, 
the early meetings were at Barbara Yeoman's barn, where it is. Um, we have meetings based in the Upper Delaware River Association, which I was a secretary, and other local community groups. Reuse of Industries Library, which was, which filled the front end of the dormitory building. It was not well cataloged, uh, but it was uh, some, over, some rooms that were over full of books. Um, take what you want and leave the rest was the, uh, the rule. Free confidential short-term weather, warm weather emergency housing in the dorm for mm -hmm. victims of domestic violence, referred by the Women's Resource Center, which is now Victims Intervention Program in Homestead. Mm -hmm. And seasonal lodging for National Park Service rangers and intern stations on the Upper Delaware. Mm -hmm. And there, there's documentation of that on the website as well. And encounter groups from Trenton State College called Personal Growth Laboratory during the early 1980s cast lodging and refer rehearsal space for the industry festival of new plays, some directed by John Rue, my brother, at the Nutshell in nearby Lake Huntington. Open to the public yoga classes taught by River Road neighbor Susan Sullivan, another well-known local woman. Public venue for dances, dinners, and concerts in the rec hall of the local town, like the All Brothers Band, they've paid a bug again. Annie Hack and other local artists, and uh, other special events. A topic that came up in conversation with guests seated by the fireplace at Innisfree was a treasure note that was left behind by the place's builder, A.J. Thomas. Um, the note hung on the wall in the front office, and numerous people who visited the place did their best to find the valuable stuff to the ground and speculated on what it might have been. I don't know if you can read the handwriting on the note, but I want you to look for valuable stuff in the ground buried at the post by the Bruder House. And there's a line crossed out, I slept by the riverside. And also look at the round Bruder under the feed room on the lower side. You must divide it with Alfred. Uh, the treasure note was found and returned by locksmith Ed Dill of South Baltimore after he dismantled an old two-ton safe that he picked up from Innisfree in 1981. Mr. Dill found the note inside the safe's wall and took the time to return it uh, with 3 by 5 index card. The old safe uh, took up space on the first floor of the dorm, but the portion of the building eight years later would be damaged by fire and was used for a while as a cabinet, but it was never locked. No one from Innisfree had, had its combination, and we had no real need for a two-ton safe anyway. <laughs> uh, the original note, encased in plastic, is now in the possession of Safety Nash. Um, surprising treasure hunters, after a few years of searching, $20,000, $810 in cash was unearthed beneath the round Bruder house to the south of the garage, uphill from Innisfree's parking lot, on River Road. By some means, the ground had hung on to this treasure until just such a time as this. This is the, we also call it the little chicken coop. It was a, it was a small brooder house. That, uh, in 1970, we had, I think, up to 25 chickens in this little brooder house. And, but this very treasure long predates that, so underneath the building. Um, according to copies of, copies of public documents and tape obtained in 1986, which I obtained in 1986 under the Freedom of Information Act from the Department of Treasury, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing addressed to me, the discovery consisted of de decomposing U.S. currency, buried in rolls for decades under an abandoned chicken coop in metal buckets and broken glass jars. The cash was decomposing and was barely recognized. Uh, officials in Washington, D.C. described the find, which consisted largely, slightly less than 2,000 separate notes, mostly of 10, 5, and $20 bills. Buried currency soaked in water and covered with mud. Currency appeared to have been buried for several decades. Notes were rolled in more than 20 wads, each held by a rubber band. Although many notes had become pulp like substance mired with mud, they appeared to be of full value. So some notes were processed whole, while others were processed by the method of duplicating 
portraits were used for the most part. Where the portraits were not available within the individual rolls of currency, other portions of the notes were duplicated, e.g. upper left corners, etc. Predominant Federal Reserve Bank and oldest notes could not be determined because of the deterioration of the currency. That's from the report by the technician who analyzed and counted this uh, lot of money. After consulting with legal counsel, it was decided that this buried treasure was the property of the corporation and could just be used to help maintain the property and defray operating expenses. expenses. <coughs> Another factor in that legal opinion was that under the terms of the sale to industry corporation, the, the uh, sale of the property included everything that was in the, in the buildings and on the property. It, it was pretty extensive uh, transfer. So it wasn't, it wasn't just a transfer of land and buildings, but all of the contents. Interestingly, from the sound of the above note, there might still be a sum secreted on the property by the post somewhere which to, to my knowledge was never found despite repeated searches and consultations with local psychics. <laughs> what was found <coughs> excuse me, was located under the feed room. The note also mentions two, two other locations. The meaning of I slept by the riverside which was stricken out remains unclear. As of now current owner, Cynthia Nash, has not given up hope of finding the second deposit of valuable stuff. It's always good to have hope. Could this have been a second buried treasure across the street? Uh, picture it right with retired farmer Oscar Rocky, the former owner of the place, who preserved the Skinner Falls Bridge marker in a barn after unearthing it on his property in the bridge in the early 1970s. And at left, retired civil engineer Tom Van Orden at the, This is a picture that I took from the River Reporter back in 86 or something. Um, 1992, I'm sorry. Um, and Oscar Rocky showed me the spot where he, he found his marker and was really directly across the street from the Brown Bruder House uh, at Industry, across River Road. Rocky said he had stumbled across the bracket protruding from the back of the marker while walking, oh, thank you very much, while walking his property sometime between 1972 and 1975. Uh, the property across the street never belonged to industry. So he subdivided that out. And that's, I, I tried pulling on it, pretty near pulled my arm off, you recall. The marker was reportedly buried face down near a portable brooder house. I mean, this is for the paper, but I'm uh, near a portable brooder house across River Road from the property currently, no currently noted as Innisfree, which was built by Rocky's late father in law, A.J. Thomas. I think it was right over here around these hemlocks, he said. At present, I understand that that marker is in possession of the Historical Society, is that right? Or an individual from. No. Where is it? Yeah, it's on the board. So maybe that's valuable stuff in the ground. Oh, it is. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and it was directly across the street from uh, that's the pile of wood. April 20th, 1989, addition to the River Reporter carried a headline that said Nonprofit Retreat Center to Open All Week. In recent years, the nonprofit retreat center has only accepted guests on weekends. While Innisfree's main focus is organized groups, individual guests and families are also welcome. This is 1989 after the transfer from Innisfree Corporation to owners Button and Rue. The facility is owned by Button and Rue until June of Lawrenceville, now taking up full time residence in Milanville. Formerly, they commuted every weekend. But is president of Industry Corporation, which leases the premises. It's nine trustees, none of whom are paid, meet once per year. Bud is about to retire after 25 years of public teaching experience and Anne from 20 years in private nonprofit daycare administration and teaching. Uh, these days, in the present, uh, 2024, in its 37th years of, year of existence, 
few current members at the Upper Delaware Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, which I mentioned earlier, remember meeting at Innisfree. Um, Lori Stewart was an exception. <laughs> and there was an exception. I don't know if anybody else here ever attended there, but for 11 years, the fellowship met rent-free Sunday mornings in Innisfree's rec hall, contributing toward the cost of heating the building one day per week and for a portion of public liability insurance premium. Though the fellowship did not enjoy exclusive use of Ministry's Rec Hall, the walls were decorated with banners and documents identifying it as a Unitarian Universalist meeting place. <coughs> and a sign was mounted on the garage facing River Road, which you could see up there. Uh, after 1998, the fellowship moved to Beach Lake Community Center after Ministry was sold. And currently, meetings are held five miles down river Sunday mornings in the Merrickburg Union building. I am not going to read this entire statement for purpose, but it is on the website for anyone who's interested. Um, this statement of purpose was adopted, it was constructed and adopted by the group that was meeting in the Rec Hall at Industry, the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, um, adopted June 17, 1990, coinciding with the fellowship's affiliation with the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations, the denomination. So, those of you who can read quickly enough, get a sense of um, what Unitarian Universalism is about, and uh, it fit well into Innisfree's evolved philosophy. And when I say evolved philosophy, I mean it as distinct from 1970 and 71. When a local group of parents asked for help in starting a parent-run Montessori elementary school in 1991, they met with the board of directors of the Unitarian Fellowship and negotiated articles of agreement under which the fellowship gave corporate sponsorship to the River School and provided this unincorporated parent group with exemption from taxation and government regulations on non-church sponsored schools. So if they had started their own school on a commercial basis or without the nonprofit status, they, um, or the church-sponsored status, they would have had more regulations to deal with. Um, the picture here is uh, the, the Upper Delaware Unitarian Universalist Fellowship and the River School held a joint uh, holiday service, December 24, 1991, in Industries Recreation Hall. And uh, I'm not gonna try to list everybody there. I tried to get everybody's name. There's a mystery woman listed and a mystery child, but Anne Rose in the center. And John, my brother, only Angela, and my father, Bud Ruth, in the red sweater. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Jill says no. Okay. <laughs> they did a lot of work on the uh, dormitory, uh, the dormitory building, and uh, I think they actually winterized at least the ground level, maybe more, the second floor. Yeah, the mid floor, and I mean, the first two levels of the dorm, they, they insulated and heated. Uh, I'm not going to try to read that article, but again, all of this is on the web, and this PowerPoint will be on the web as well. Uh, to support the, the parents group, um, we applied, the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship applied for a grant uh, from the uh, Unitarian Universalist Association and was awarded $4,500 for the school because Unitarian Universalism supports education. That, that was the rationale for the denomination making this gift to the River School. Um, and that, that money was um, applied toward the renovation of the building. Habitat for Humanity was another organization born in industry and which was nurtured, nurtured at the start and which has received financial contributions from the Upper Delaware UU Fellowship since its early years. Uh, from 1989 until 1993, Bud <coughs> made public speaking engagements, attending meetings, and the physical work of constructing houses like an unpaid part-time job. This was in the uh, Scranton Tribune, it's hard to read, it's Andrea Henry Hine. Uh, Bud Rue was industry's founder, and in later years he, he was an owner of the property with Ann Rue. He was on the board of directors of the Unitarian Fellowship uh, at 
that point, I was I was the president. He was a board member of the fellowship, not the board of industry. But by 1992, he said he was hard, starting to feel like his time with the religious fellowship was not as productive as he wanted it to be. As he was, he was feeling very productive with Habitat. He wanted the Upper Delaware UU Fellowship to do more than host interesting speakers on Sunday mornings. He said this in board meetings, and at least one occasion he wrote a letter to the board, which I just found this letter a few months ago in the organizational files of the Unitarian Fellowship. Um, he's proposing a modification to the budget to include, um, well, I'll read it. I would like to propose a modification to the budget presented. I believe an area of concern that is not adequately addressed is community outreach. There's not a single line item that can be fairly described as reflecting our fellowship's commitment to action at the local level. Clearly, my own agenda includes Wayne County Habitat for Humanity, and there are other local causes that deserve our outspoken money, words, and deeds. It seems to me that a church that only supports itself is not worth much. More than words are necessary to make changes in our community. It is my position that a new line item would be created that would reflect at least 10% of the whole budget, even if that meant reducing all other line items an equivalent percentage. It's true that we would probably spend time debating which cause we should support over others, and that's as it should be. I'm not arguing for all or many worthwhile causes. I'm arguing that we should support some. That was May 30th, 1992. Um, the following year, in direct response to Bob Green's plea to give back to the community, the membership of the Upper Delaware Unitarian Universalist Fellowship voted unanimously. Yay, we had a consensus <laughs> to hold a walkathon to raise funds for four local organizations Habitat for Humanity, Wayne County, Interfaith Outreach United. Victims Intervention Program, and the UU United Nations Office. The walk was scheduled for October 24th, 1993. Members collected pledges from people they knew and by the end had raised between $3,500 and $4,000, 100% of which was divided equally among the above named groups. So we called the walk for social justice. 24 people participated according to published accounts. The, this photo and the next one are from the council record. The walkers stepped off from the Tustin Kashekta Library, crossed the bridge, and walked north on River Road toward industry. A mile or so into the journey, Bud Brew sat down on a rock to rest. He was picked up by the Reverend Ray Pontier, who was driving a sweep car for anyone who became tired or needed water. Reverend Pontier shared that Bud puffed a few times on his asthma inhaler and seemed to fall asleep in the car. When they got to Innisfree, he was unconscious. Uh, the lead sentence in the River Reporter's front page article was, Clyde Bud Rue walked his last steps in the name of such society's forgotten people. Because it seemed likely to draw more than could be accommodated at Innisfree, a service organized by his family was held at the Milanville Methodist Church, filling all the pews and going out into the front yard. The printed order of service and texts of some of the remarks have remained on the web since that time. The family members spoke, as did friends and associates from his recent life and from the early days of ministry. A stone at the foot of the old oak on the Innisfree Hill marks the spot where Bud's cremated remains were interred. He was 59 when he died. Quotation attributed to Kurt Vonnegut seemed to his family to encapsulate his attitude toward the meaning of life. We're here to help each other get through this thing, whatever it is. Since 1993, members of the Upper Delaware Fellowship have collected among themselves and from the public donations under the name of Bud Roof Memorial Fund for Social Justice which had its start in the industry. The board of directors of the Upper Delaware Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, which meets Sunday mornings, met on July 17, 2024. Lori. Lori's the president, by the way. I'm the vice president. 
designated four organizations for this year's Flood New Memorial Fund, 100% of which will be divided among Habitat for Humanity in Wayne County, Victims Intervention Program, Bowling, Growing Older Together, and Sullivan Allies Leading Together. Tax deductible donations to the 2024 Bud Rue Memorial Fund for Social Justice. They mailed to the Upper Delaware Fellowship at PO Box 47 in Ellisburg. And Jill has a handout. Anybody would like information? Just about pass it around. There will be, sometime soon, there will be a Venmo or PayPal link on the website. It's not there yet. I have to get that out of the Last year's distributions included both the Bud Rue Memorial Fund donations and other amounts collected by the uh, Upper Delaware and the New Fellowship. This, these, were donate, these donations were made by the Unitarian Fellowship in 2023. $5,000 to the Homesdale Library, $1,000 to VIP, $1,000 to Habitat for Humanity of Wake County, Growing Older Together, $1,000, Doctors Without Borders, a special project of the River Reporter, Narrowsburg Economical Food Pantry, Wayne County Food Pantry, Clarity Water, Grand Circle Foundation, and the Wayne County Foundation. All of those were $1,000 each, except for the last one, which was $500. There's a picture there with a big, a big check being presented to the Wayne County Library, $5,000, that was um, a few months ago. A tragic afterward. Following the death of Bud Rue, his widow, Pam Rue, remained at Innisfree for a few years before moving to Lakewood. Uh, I, I myself, had previously re relocated from Innisfree over the river in Sullivan County. The property was occupied only by tenants. On August 28, 1997, a tragic fire occurred on the ground level of the Innisfree dormitory which took the life of a 43-year-old single mother named Patricia Wall. No one from the Rue family was living on the property at this time, and I only know what I've read in a few news accounts. I did not know Ms. Wall. The fire was ruled arson and her death as a murder. Published reports that I've seen state the crime has not been solved. In preparation for this presentation tonight, I filed an open records request with the Pennsylvania State Police for the present status of their investigation of this murder. Um, an official response of some kind is due shortly. Roughly a month ago, they wrote me a letter saying that 30 days from the date of this letter, I would have a response. 30 days from the date of that letter is this Thursday. I haven't heard anything yet. I don't know. I'm sure I'll hear something. It may say we can't tell you anything because it's a pending criminal investigation. It's a cold case. I think people over the years have asked me about this. I've told you what I know. I think the public deserves to know what happened. Here. And in response, as I said, actually it's not tomorrow, it's Thursday. The response is due. Um, if anything is received from the state police, whatever is received, I, I will uh, do my best to put it on the web. On March 31st, 1995, the 12 remaining members of the Board of Trustees of Ministry Corporation each signed an out of existence with slash withdrawal affidavit, bringing the corporation to a close. Uh, on July 17th, 1998, uh, Cynthia Nash purchased the property, and Cynthia has honored the place's history by retaining the name and describing the premises as an incubator for community and creativity. And you can find her uh, on Facebook, in its free PA. Uh, in closing, kindly let me share the words of American historian Dr. Ken Burns, speaking two months ago to graduates of Brandeis University. Listen, be curious, not cool. Insecurity makes liars of us all. Remember, none of us get out of here alive. The inevitable vicissitudes of life, no matter how well gated our communities will visit, visit us all. Grief is a part of life, and if you explore its painful precincts, it will make you stronger. Do good things, help others. 
Leadership is humility and generosity squared. Remember the opposite of faith is not doubt. Doubt is central to faith. The opposite of faith is certainty. These core values build character, creativity, and community. I learned these things at industry. I would, I would like to go back to that. Go, go back to that video. Can somebody help us get back to an earlier slide? This is, um, this is not the final version of the PowerPoint. Excuse me. Is it close? Yes. It's a, it's a five minute. Uh, Which slide, Tom? Okay. There's only one video in there. Uh, I just, I was originally, I was going to put it in the middle. This one. And then I decided to move it. It's a picture of a place. Oh, no. Keep going. It's a five-minute video of industry taken in 1970. Uh, it was uh, unknown photographer wandering around the place with a super eight camera, uh, taking pictures of people uh, in action. And it, okay, I'm on it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let's see if I can. Can you double-click on the video, the YouTube video? But it's not coming up on your screen. So I think, do I have to put it on, which number is that, 21? Okay, let me do this, and then let me advance to slide 21. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, how big was the property? 13.7 acres. And how many um, orders? Yes. Would you have it Fifty to sixty max. That would be oh. sixty would be extremely crowded, but I think we counted out sixty beds one time. Come on. Thank you. Um, what was the age group generally? In nineteen seventy, seventy one? Yeah, when well, they were the yeah, yeah. literature said twelve there to eighteen. There were a few right. who now, were if I a little click younger. On this, you um, and there were a number that were a little bit older. I'm mostly teenagers. Teenagers. I'm talking about the earliest program, the experimental programs in the beginning. Any the other question? If we don't get the video to show up here, I would encourage you all to go on. If you go to tomlu.net slash industry, um, there, there's a much more detailed uh, website. What I did was when uh, Opal asked me to speak tonight, the way I started working on it was by constructing the website. I, I wrote it on the, the web, and then um, I, I pulled out from that to make this PowerPoint slideshow. Normally, when I, <laughs> when I write for the web, which I am not new to, but normally when I write for now, publication on the web, I don't publish it until it's done. In this case, I did. I published it. I made it world viewable um, online on purpose, so, so people who were involved in industry at the beginning who were, I was not in regular touch with could communicate with me and add to it or sorry, see what direction I was heading in the presentation. Yeah, there was one man in particular, uh, Clark Malone, who was one of the founders who I heard was working on something to go along with this, but I wasn't getting through to it. So I just, I just published it. I turned it on basically on the web. And it's undergone some evolution. So if you've looked at it before, I encourage you to look at it again because it's more complete now. It has to be, you have, you have the, the video on your website. Yep, you could do that. Well, that's the video. We know that, but we have to restart the timer. Oh. All right, you know what? Why don't you go to a web browser and go to, go to tomroom.net slash Oh, Okay, so I have to get out of this. You're done with yep. this. Okay. Um, Did those folks yes. pass around? Yes. Yes. Tomroom.net. That has a website on there too. Okay. Yeah, sure. Tomroom.net mm -hmm. slash industry. Industry. Um, um, slash industry. Slash industry. Slash industry. Slash industry. Sorry about the technical yeah. difficulty yeah. with the video. This one slash industry? Yes. Yeah. Okay. No yeah. internet. No internet. Okay. Sorry. No video tonight, but you can see it on the web. What's the video about? As I explained. Uh, it was just, okay. It's, uh, 
an unknown photographer walked around the place in the summer of 1970 taking video of campers working on arts and crafts projects, playing basketball, talking with each other, sitting around in small groups. There's also some footage toward the end of the waterfall in Callsdale. Too bad. I, when I downloaded it, I didn't. It didn't download it. No, because I don't have their web. Okay. Anybody has any other questions? Get up. Feel free. You can also speak to my mother, who, as I said, was a founder. Uh, I can't. Sometimes I can't. Thank you. Thank you. 